Our next speaker is Dr. Wesley Wong. Um, Wes is a research scientist at uh, the T.H. Chan School of Public Health at Harvard. Um, he's also a former IDM postdoc. Um, and uh, Wes is an expert. If you just look at his uh, uh, papers, it's basically just a series of very innovative uh, models linking genetics and uh, epidemiology and really trying to extract the most that we can out of uh, complex genetic data to inform uh, public health decision making. And today's talk is exactly in that vein. All right. Um, now I feel kind of bad after that amazing introduction because <clears throat> I actually want to question the organizers of this session for sandwiching me between two AI talks. Um, <laughs> um, I apologize in advance. The things I'm going to talk about are far less, far, far more unsexy than AI. But anyway, um, here I'm talking about a kind of inference uh, framework for trying to understand how we can use parasite genetics to, to reconstruct transmission chains. And so, uh, is this the clicker? Good. So, um, I'm a research scientist at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and we are focused a lot on trying to understand malaria genomic epidemiology. A lot of the work that we're doing within Senegal is trying to really understand how can we use the genetics of the parasite to understand something about the transmission of the malaria parasite in a given country, and therefore use that information to help inform public health decision making. And a lot of this work is done uh, with Sarah Volkman in the back over there and Dada Njai, who's currently not here. Um, but this is a very, very big, very large collaborative um, collaboration that really involves a lot of people. And I'm only able to really give a very tiny, tiny snapshot of all the work that is going on within this collaboration. So one thing that is unusual about the malaria, malaria parasite, particularly when it comes with the genetics, is that unlike almost every other infectious disease out there, it actually undergoes sex. And as a result, results uh, undergoes this process known as sexual recombination. And the consequence of this particular uh, quirk of the malaria parasite is that the definition of strain in, the malaria, in malaria genetics is a little bit fuzzy. Because after a single transmission event, you can generate progeny parasites that share a significant portion of the genome with the parental parasites. And so through this entire process, you're constantly generating new diversity that is basically a mix of the old diversity that's present in the population beforehand. And this actually causes a lot of problems with um, uh, standard genetic epidemiology inferences, particularly if you're more familiar with the virus worlds. A lot of the techniques that are used to study transmission and to relate genetics to epidemiology that are used in other, other systems such as bacteria and viruses tend to have complications when it comes to dealing with this phenomena of sexual recombination or just recombination in general. But what's kind of interesting is that if we actually leverage the fact that this is a unique quirk of the malaria parasite and try to understand what we can do with this genetic relatedness, it turns out from our empirical data, it suggests that this data can be used to try to understand connectivity within a particular country. Within Senegal, what I'm showing you on the top over there is a network graph that's showing you the kind of the amount of pairwise relatedness sharing across different sites within Senegal. And then within the subsets of it, it's kind of the relatedness structures between individual parasites or individual infections that we observe within a particular sampling region. And what this genetic relatedness is suggesting is that there's actually quite a bit of connectivity of the parasite within the country. Even though we have a lot of sampling sites taken from, the, uh, from a fairly large geographic region, there's enough genetically related parasites between sites that suggest that somehow the parasite is moving across, or the parasite population is moving across the country, and therefore there's a lot of importation and potential migration happening within the country. And the question that I wanted to ask is, well, can we take this information and actually reconstruct a transmission chain? Can we use the genetic relatedness of the parasite to really understand who gave rise, uh, which infection gave rise to what other infection, and therefore ask some serious questions, uh, start addressing some serious questions about where are the infections coming from? Are infections uh, local or are, they com or are they imported? And so in order to do this, we, uh, yeah, so this is a question. Can we use genetic relatedness to reconstruct transmission chains and determine where parasites are coming from using just this one genetic metric? And so this is kind of a diagram showing you how it is that genetic rela genetically related parasites actually get formed within the, in the, pop within, uh, actually get formed with the population. And the goal of this is really show you that sexual reproduction in malaria is intimately tied with transmission history. 
for a genetically related parasites to appear in the first place, you have to have first created um, a situation where an individual is infected with multiple parasite strains. So that's what's happening over there on the left over there with the blue and the red. Once this happens, in the next mosquito transmission event, if the mosquito picks up those two individual strains, this provides the parasite with its first opportunity to undergo sexual reproduction in the form of outcrossing or uh, genetic mating between two genetically distinct individuals such that you actually create child progenies that are distinct from one another and distinct from their parents, but not completely. They are going to be about 50% the same. In this next event, what happens is that, well, after the first transmission event, you end up with a, you could end up with a situation where an infection contains two genetically related parasite strains. And in the, in the following uh, transmission event, this is where a phenomenon known as inbreeding happens or genetic related amongst genetically related parasite strains. And so what this actually causes, what well, the, the effect of this is that you can get um, increasingly related parasites within the population based in part on this kind of transmission, uh, transmission history. And so the, this project is really trying to leverage the fact that this relatedness metric is not a completely random statistical variable. It is actually governed by quite a few biological processes. In fact, we have an intuition that genetic relatedness is a reflection of genealogy. If I were to ask anyone in this room, what is the expected relatedness between you and a brother? Well, if you've taken biology 101, whatever, X number of years back, you probably know that, well, I share about 50% of my DNA with my brother and I inherited 50% of my DNA from my, 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 mother, my mother and father. If I were to have children, the, my kid would share about 25% of their DNA with, the with my parent or their grandfather or grandparent. So the idea is that, well, can we use the exact value of the relatedness or some attribute of the genetic relatedness to really reconstruct its genealogical past? and therefore reconstruct the pot a potential transmission chain for how these parasites happen with the population. Because those IBD networks, or those genetic related networks that are showing it, is messy as a data structure. What would be interesting is if you could take that same network representation and transform it into something a bit more useful, like a pedigree that actually tells you who is inherited by what, and therefore infer what the next transmission step is. For this to work, however, the thing that we're most interested in is identifying those genealogical relationships that are indicative of vertical transmission. So specifically, the parent-child relationships, the grandparent-grandchild relationships, and so on and so forth. Because, and here's the most important logical leap, if you see two individuals and you look at the parasites within them, you identify one as being the parent, uh, containing the parental strain, and one identifying, and you identify the other one as containing the child strain, then, the, then it's likely that the parental infection transmitted that parasite into the next, into that individual carrying the child parasite. And so it's the really, the vertical chain on this pedigree tree is what I'm hoping can be used to reconstruct transmission history. And of course, this all depends on can you even do this in the first place? And so what this approach is, the approach I took was to develop a likelihood model. Now, the very eagle-eyed viewers of this audience will recognize this is not a true likelihood model. It's actually a pseudo-likelihood model. If you would like to get into technical uh, definitions, come find me afterwards. But anyway, there are three main components of this particular likelihood model. They are, are all about measuring some different aspect of the genetic relatedness. The first term is, is trying to es es evaluate the probability of a particular genealogical geneal class based off of the total relatedness or the total amount of genetic relatedness that is shared between any two individuals. The other two terms are specifically asking things about the IBD segment block distribution. So the total relatedness is essentially the summation of this complex kind of geometric structure that is called, that is found within the actual structure, that is found within the genome itself. This plot I'm showing you is an IBD map or an identity by descent map that shows you which sections of each chromosome are genetically related to one another. In gray, it's un that section of the chromosome is not related. They were inherited from two different parents. And in orange, that section is genetically related. They were inherited from the same parent. And so the question I wanted to ask and wanted to determine was whether or not if we include not just the total relatedness between any two individuals, but kind of this kind of nice complex structure that's being that's observed within the rest of the chromosome uh, or the rest of the genome, can we actually use these types of information to distinguish uh, different parasite genealogical relationships, particularly the parent-child grandparent, grandchild, and so on and so forth. 
So one other thing to note, I want to stress is that this likelihood function actually contains 29 features within it. So you have one feature for the total of it, the genome, genome wide relatedness. You have 14 for the number of um, IBD segments per chromosome and 14 for the, the size of the largest IBD segment per chromosome. And so this is, even though it looks like it's only three terms, there's actually quite a few terms that are going to the likelihood model to try to do this, this particular inference. And so under the hood, this likelihood model is actually based off of the mechanistic meiosis model that actually simulates the expected relatedness and IBD box, segment box distributions um, for any, it's a simulation, basically. And it allows me to generate different expectations for every genealogical class. I'm not going to get into it too much here, but this model is calibrated to a new set of genetic cross data that was provided kindly to us, kindly to us by the Anderson Group, Safferda Group, and the Valen Group, which are uh, at Notre Dame, Texas Biomed, and Seattle Children's, which are, um, those three organizations. And what was really exciting about this particular data set is that it actually provided me essentially 10,000 different comparisons to calibrate this meiosis model to, for, uh, to and to actually um, inform the parameters of the likelihood model that I will use for inference. So this is the structure of the model. Um, what I'm showing you here is the various genealogical classes that I'm going to be examining in this particular case. So there's, if I, if I were to compare this guy, this guy, that's a parent-child relationship. This guy with this guy, that's a full sibling or myotic sibling, or just think of it as a brother-sister uh, brother right now. Over here, P1 to F21, that's a grandparent-grandchild relationship, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of relationships that outcross relationships that are being represented in this tree. And for convenience sakes, I'm going to start grouping them into first, second, and third degree relatives. First being parent-child and full siblings, second degree being grandparent-grandchild, full of uncular half-siblings, and third degree relatives, uh, which are the uh, gray ones over there. What I'm showing you on the right is actually a visual representation of all the 29 features that are being used by the inference, the likelihood model, just to get the sense of the identifiability of this problem. Is it even possible to use these features to distinguish classes. And what you can see within this PCA plot is that, well, there is definitely identifiability between some of these genealogical classes, particularly if you were focused, oops, sorry, that's spoilers. Um, particularly based on the PCA plot, what I expect this likelihood model to be able to do is to distinguish first, second, and third degree relatives from one another. It's not clear on this PCA, on this PCA plot immediately, but I'm also hoping that it will be allow me to distinguish between the first degree relatives, the parent child and the full sibling uh, category, because the one I want for transmission tree reconstruction is parent child. All right, so here's the actual, um, the actual inference results, classification results to get rid of this model for the simulated data and on empirical data. Um, in general, we're able to use this model to actually distinguish uh, between first, second, and third degree relatives to a high degree of accuracy. But what is actually more exciting to me is that even amongst the first degree relatives, which is the parent child, the full siblings, and uh, this meiotic sibling category, which is a massive headache, and I will not explain here. Please find me afterwards. <laughs> uh, again, this has to do with the fact that malaria genetics is weird. But essentially, we are able to actually uh, identify with quite a, a high degree of accuracy what is a parent child relationship from, us, uh, from all these other uh, different between level classes that are present within here. And this is what this performance is in the simulated data and this performance is within some of the empirical lab cross data that are here. So again, because you sandwiched me between two AI talks, I felt pressured to put something that's machine learning related. So <laughs> um, what I'm showing you here is if I were to take the same data and instead of using the likelihood or the pseudo likelihood function to actually do the classification, if, there, if I throw it into a neural net, what would happen? And Although I kind of facetiously said I just threw it in because I'm a sandwich between AI, there's actually a purpose for this in that, technically speaking, I was not sure whether or not the features of the likelihood model were completely statistically independent of one another. The likelihood model, the way it's constructed, assumes that they're all independent. And so the question I wanted to ask is, what happens if they're not? What if there are some hidden correlation structures between these features that could affect classifications? And so my solution was, I'm not going to write down a function. I'm just going to throw it into a machine learning model and see if it can learn it and, there, and whether or not the predictions it creates are going to be any different than the predictions that are created for the likelihood model. And the answer is pretty much the same. So again, I, so I, I go back to my original justification after it in because I'm sandwiched between two AI models. All right, so here's the piece that I'm more interested in right now. What can I use this to identify um, pairs importations within the productive population? 
And so what I did is I simulated a hypothesis importation chain where I have an imported strain. And remember, with genetic relatedness, you need to have two parasite strains entering the population, uh, entering into, into a situation. So this is a situation where an imported strain arrives, it's being super infected by another strain within the population, it outcrosses, and it keeps going like that over and over and over again. So this is a hypothesized importation strain within a population where there's sufficient levels of transmission, transmission such that individual will be infected multiple times with genetically distinct strains. Under this one condition, we can actually uh, uh, classify these genetic relationships with a high degree of accuracy, particularly the parent-child ones, and therefore reconstruct the transmission tree off of it. Where it gets really, 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 really messy is if you don't have this nice structure where you can guarantee outcrossing happening, but in a situation where inbreeding is more common. So this is a situation that would be more common in a lower transmission area where you're not guaranteed or not likely to be, in, to be reinfected with a second infection. Under this particular situation, you can see that, yes, technically speaking, we can identify parent-child kind of okay, but everything else kind of falls off a cliff. And so what this actually suggests is that this strategy of using pairwise genetic relatedness to infer the genealogical classes and reconstruct transmission chains will not work in a population where inbreeding is rampant, which, if you just go one more step down, will not work very well in an area with low transmission setting. Despite this, there is an out. <laughs> So it turns out you can overcome the problems associated with inbreeding if you change your perspective slightly and not focus only on pairwise comparisons, but start triangulating things based off of a known pair, uh, based off of a hypothesized pedigree tree and take it and use the structure of that tree to allow for, allow you to add a third comparator into the mix. So basically you're doing a triangle comparison now. And it's very, very similar to the geospatial stuff where they do try, well, triangulation because you have three data, data points at that point. This is a situation, oops. The pedigree tree I'm showing you here is a situation that was generated by us for the, um, by the Anderson groups and who were part of this data where they actually generate a two generation cross. And they actually give us data for the parasites that are present in the first generation and the parasites in the second generation. And so the goal was, can we actually determine whether or not the parasites in the second generation were actually true F2s or grandparents of the original one, or some weird mix or back crosses of going on, because they have some specific questions about uh, QTL, or quantitative trait locus uh, experimental design that they wanted to uh, assess. And so this was going to force us to actually think about inbreeding a little bit more carefully and modify our likelihood function in order to take into to, to get multiple comparisons. And so basically, if you were able to generate, if you were able to have a tree and take advantage of the structure of the tree to enable multiple comparisons, you can indeed start to distinguish all these inbreeding classes from one another. And what is actually kind of interesting is that within the empirical data, what the model is actually suggesting is that the second generation progeny pool from the data that they give us, most of them are not actually F1s. Most of them are actually the back crosses of a F1 that was generated in the first pool to one of the parental strains. And so this is kind of interesting for me because this is the first evidence of non-random mating or non and assorted mating within the malaria parasite. Whether or not this is universal in the epidemiological world is another question entirely. It might have to do with some of the strange artificial conditions that these parasites find themselves in within the laboratory setting. But this is actually kind of interesting, and I'm interested in, co in collaborating with them more just to see how, how much more this phenomenon of non-random meaning will have in the future going on forward. But in order to kind of um, summarize, genetic relatedness can indeed be used to, to reconstruct transmission lineages <laughs> if... A, outcrossing is predominant, so it's in a moderate to high transmission setting where they are actually are related presence, but super infection is pretty high. Or if you actually have an idea of a, a hypothesized pedigree tree or a hypothesized transmission tree that relates a particular cluster of related parasites that you are, are examining. In this case, what you will be doing is not evaluating the likelihood of a particular genealogy, but evaluating the likelihood of a proposed tree. So in this particular case, what would be, what I would like to be able to do is to hook up this algorithm that we have with random tree generation algorithms. So allow us to actually explore based off of the data that you have, what is the most likely hypothesized transmission tree that can uh, explain the data and therefore help us identify where these particular things are coming from. All right. That was a lot. Um, I would like to thank everyone with the collaboration. And again, because you stuck me between two AI talks. <laughs> Um, I would like to just close off on a slight sneak peek on a project that I'm thinking about where I'm trying to think about how do we actually predict clinically relevant phenotypes from molecular surveillance or genomic data. Broadly speaking, this is a genotype to phenotype prediction problem where we have to somehow be able to predict 
a particular phenotype or drug or say drug resistance from a combination of genetic markers, which are very difficult to do because of many non nonlinear interactions between genetic markers and phenotypic terms. Uh, I'm not going to be able to get into this uh, too much, but this is a very machine learning heavy approach that involves synthetic data generation, try to fill in gaps with sparse data sets. And over here is just a, a teaser of synthetic data that I generated that actually mi mimics some of the real the empirical data that we've generated in the lab. Again, um, I can't go into this. Find me afterwards. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you, Wes. Any questions? Thank you. Very interesting talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions. When you generate your parent offspring, mm -hmm. they assume mating is random, right? Yes. There is no. Uh, uh, is it uh, known or is it an assumption? It would be assortative mating, which can bias, I presume, right? Yeah. So. The construction, oh, sorry, the construction of the meiosis model is such that I just take two parents and force them to mate. And so uh -huh. that model itself, because I'm not simulating population level things, it's just literally, right. I have two parents, mate them, um, and create the expected distributions. In that case, it is considered random mating um, right. on that level for classification purposes. Mm -hmm. It's not random recombination, however, because the meiosis model yes. does incorporate crossover interference and cross, um, cross <coughs> crossover interference and non-random placement of the chiasma that actually mm -hmm. forms in the meiosis. So the, the distributions of uh, relatedness blocks are not completely random, it is a little bit structured. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, another thing, you say you could use it to identify imported strains, right? Uh, but to do something like this, you would have to have more or less complete scan of local, the, Whatever, diversity, right? Since otherwise it would still be something common. So this gets into yeah. the second layer of inference, which is how yeah. do you quantify the relatedness or the IBD segment block distributions from the real data? Right. And so from there we do, you are correct. Right. Because the HMN that's used for inference does rely on the accuracy of population level of frequencies. Mm -hmm. And so you might not require a complete scan of the population, but you do need enough data to get a little frequency estimations correct. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Um, thank you. Excellent talk. Can I ask uh, how is this going to be affected by the multiplicity of uh, co-infection? So because this question was simply centered on what is the value of genetics and what is there actual theoretical possibility to use this information to pictures of vision trees, I actually assume that you know the phase um, of the genomes um, that are within the simulation. So when it comes to multiplicity of infection, there, in order to apply this technique to real data, we still are missing that um, inference layer that allows to deconvolve the, the, poly, uh, the multiple strain infections so that you can actually identify what the individual strains are within each infection. Once that is done, that's where this algorithm comes in. Um, so for comparing, for real life inference, for, com for examining single strain infections, this will work. When you're doing it with multiple strain infections, that is going to require an additional layer of inference that um, we are currently working on with uh, different strategies involving long read sequencing to try to actually phase these genomes over here, but that's a separate thing entirely as well. Thank you, Wes. Uh, let's thank Wes again.